everybody says get a deal and the money will follow mm -hmm. total bs it's not true it's completely false mm -hmm. you have to dig the investor well before you're thirsty as the saying goes if you're an active real estate investor and you're looking to do larger deals you're in the right place we are going to go and take the conceptual type of stuff that you listen to from other real estate podcasts and bring it down to the tactical, the nitty gritty, the actual actionable types of things that other real estate investors that went big did to grow their own real estate empire. You're listening to the Go Big Live podcast. I'm your host, Matt Druin. Hey, everyone. How you doing? This is Matt Druin, your host of the Go Big Live real estate investors podcast. I have a amazing guest today. His name is Taylor Lote. It's Loat like boat, but with an L, right? You got it. <laughs> Taylor's mission is to help people create a life on their own terms through their uh, through real estate. Um, he has a his own podcast, which I actually am a listener of, and he actually has a seven day video course on how to vet um, how to vet passive real estate investment opportunities and identify red pla red flags in passive real estate as well as through their investment company, NT Capital. With over 150 million in multifamily real estate investments across seven markets, Taylor has the expertise to help you make informed investment decisions and help avoid the common pitfalls of the industry. Does that sum summarize it pretty well, Taylor? Yeah, I would say so. Uh, the course is seven red flags in passive real estate deals, seven bite-sized videos over seven days that are aimed at sharing uh observations and experiences that i've had in my time in the uh multifamily real estate industry over the years absolutely so i like to start the show with the same question for everybody is that you were born now you're here what happened in between at a high level Berlin wall fell uh <laughs> so that was my first big accomplishment uh, and the soviet union broke up and now here 30 years later uh here no i'm so what happened in between? Let's see. So uh, obviously went through school after I graduated from high school. I went to uh, University of Delaware. I did a degree in chemical engineering, and uh, that was really hard. Learned how to learn and work hard. Uh, and there were also some, you know, mistakes made along the way or ways that, you know, things you learn how you could have handled better, I think, through growing and growth and through maturity. And one of the big things I learned in in retrospect was um, I need to be more deliberate and intentional about how I handle stress. Uh, that was a big, had a big impact on me. And I didn't really hadn't, you know, had the perspective at the time to step back and and learn that. But now I do. And that's, you know, how we learn things in life and how we handle things. Um, so pushing forward, that was, that was quite a while ago now. I'm in my mid thirties. So, you know, I've been out of that for a while. Got my first big boy job as an engineer and, you know, finally had a couple of nickels to rub together and, um, <laughs> didn't know what I wanted to do with it. Right. I was knew I wanted to turn it into more because I hated that first job so much that, uh, kind of took me in down a pretty dark path, but I instantly knew that I needed to get my money working for me so that eventually, you know, I wouldn't have to, to work for money hopefully sooner rather than later. So the first thing that I did, or the first book, excuse me, that I read the first education that I did in the financial space was actually reading uh, that book right there, that very copy, The Intelligent Investor by Benjamin Graham, who was Warren Buffett's mentor. It's really focused around value investing in publicly traded you know, securities, stocks and bonds and that kind of a thing. And that's how I got started, investing in Wall Street products and living very frugally. I think back about what my rent was at the time for a halfway decent uh townhouse but you know it was almost nothing it was crazy how skinny i lived but took every cent that i could and plowed it into uh you know stocks and and it was a good time to be investing frankly just because of my age and you know how i got lucky timing the market mm -hmm. a few years went by i was making money through those investments and it was growing but i was doing the math right you can tell from my uh you know educational and professional background that i can i'm, I'm not terrible at math and <laughs> The math wasn't adding up in terms of getting me to where I wanted to be and also factor in that I, you know, hated my job at the time, but, you know, unrelated uh, to that. And I was looking for other ways to make money, to build wealth, to build cash flow. And, um, you know, the four hour work week was out and a lot of, uh, you know, other things out there about starting businesses, a lot of 
books and the the podcast space around real estate was really starting to grow back in the I think this was the early days of bigger pockets. It's been a long time now. Um, but started digging deeper on all kinds of entrepreneurship and and real estate. And eventually real estate was really the one that that pulled me in. I felt, you know, real estate was the best opportunity to create uh long-term cash flow and you know, passive wealth, all the things that we talk about. And, you know, just made the pivot. And and that's uh, a few years, you know, it's been years since then. Um few more notable things recently got married just a couple months ago uh just today since we talked about my my name uh <laughs> last name my wife just changed her last name today her her maiden <laughs> name is Lee three letters Lee she's going from being Lee to Loat she's never had her last name mispronounced in her life until now you know it's gonna start happening <laughs> well, congratulations anyway, either way uh yeah thanks so as a you know financial journey and and what got me into real estate investing yeah, awesome. Thanks for sharing that. I am a little bit curious before you kind of go into your first big deal. Um, I had a similar start when I thought I was going to be the, you know, Wall Street day trader, cigar chomping, Gordon Gecko type, <laughs> you know. And um, you know, you know, I thought it was going to be like a supreme rapacious Wall Street capitalist. And uh, I that was one of the first books I read as well um, is uh, The Intelligent Investor by Benjamin Graham, because I thought I was going to do it through stocks, um, you know, stocks and securities and all that stuff. And, um, yeah, Warren Buffett really became like my spirit animal as an investor. And I still kind of, you know, harness that spirit these days, especially when looking at things on, you know, risk management and uh, margin of safety and all those concepts that were um, in Benjamin Graham. But I think that the book that really changed my life a lot was The Snowball by Warren Buffett. Have you read that one? I have not. Yeah. So that's a biography of uh, Warren Buffett. And that ta talks about his entire journey from birth until up to uh, up to basically recent history. Right. And Benjamin Graham was this investor who was extreme value investor, and he had portfolios of like thousands of different positions, you know, uh, of these, you know, co good companies with good fundamentals that were trading at a significant discount to book value. And, um, you know, Warren Buffett adopted that strategy, but it wasn't until he met Charlie Munger, which basically he tied, he like married both of those philosophies together. And then, you know, the rest is history in terms of the birth of Berkshire Hathaway and stuff like that. So that being said, you know, how do you, do you still incorporate those things you've learned through Benjamin Graham, the intelligent investor and those, that education around securities and Wall Street instruments to this day? I think to some extent, you know, I couldn't, I haven't, certainly haven't erased that from my brain. I do like listening to Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger uh, speak and, you know, they're old guys, so we probably don't have a whole lot of time left with them, mm -hmm. you know, unfortunately. So we need to take advantage of that when we can. Uh, one of the things about the intelligent investor, I've picked it up recently, just again, just to try to get a flavor of it. It's a really hard read. It's it's <laughs> tough to get through. And if you're, unless you want to get into the really nerdy stuff, I think, you know, it's it wouldn't be worth picking up anyway. There are more accessible books out there about, you know, value investing. I think really my biggest take away from diving into that world and and learning more about what these guys are really doing is there's a difference between business ownership and investing right so when you're thinking about having you taking your money and investing it in whatever you invest in whether it's stocks or real estate mm -hmm. that's one thing on the other hand when you're thinking about owning a business which is really what Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger do is they own or they started or he bought Berkshire Hathaway and then they built a business around you know a value investing model essentially where they're not only say working with their own money you know right because they're bringing in investor capital and it's a, just a completely different animal from allocating your own money and there are other important books in there the e-myth is another great one mm -hmm. but really i think the the biggest my biggest takeaway from these things is to understand and acknowledge the difference between owning a business that happens to be focused around an investing model whether it's real estate investing or placing other people's capital in a certain sense like uh you know, uh, Warren Buffett and, and Charlie Munger do mm -hmm. versus, you know, having your own kitty of cash and deciding what to do with it. 
they're both very important, but they're just different ways to think about money. And I think you you can't have one or you can't have the business ownership one without the other, mm -hmm. right? Because we need to understand our investors and their priorities and all those other things. Um, but if you're solely an investor placing your own capital, you don't necessarily need to think about those uh, those other business owner slash you know entrepreneur things that a business owner needs to think about. So that's that's probably my biggest takeaway is the difference between those things. Yeah, yeah. So um, let's fast forward a little bit. Tell us about the story behind your first big deal that you did, or what was big to you at that time. Sure. So I started out as a passive investor. I'm not going to count that, but that was my first like step into the real estate space is passively investing in in deals. But you know, we'll talk about the active side. And it's it's been a few years now. So some of these details are going to be a little foggy in my memory. But um you know, we had a team of folks and and bought a property in the Texas Panhandles, a C-class multifamily, a, an older deal. And this was pre-COVID, mm -hmm. bought the property and um you know, it was not, a, it was, it was rough, right? But this was still at the time, a, a time in the market cycle when money was cheap. The pricing was such that you could get a, a C class multifamily property for a multiple that was still compelling through COVID and, and post COVID. Really, there was such a price appreciation from all of that cheap money that the spreads in terms of you know the earnings multiples cap rates all that kind of a thing really narrowed between newer nicer properties and older less nice properties so it just the risk adjustment it just didn't make sense in my opinion it doesn't really make sense to buy c class larger c class multifamilies anymore uh but yeah a team of folks and you know we raised investor money and ran the deal and you know added value did all the classic things um really the big thing that i think you learn when you buy an older c-class property is frankly how many skeletons can be in the closets of these older properties that have maybe not been quite as well taken care of because <laughs> you know maybe the owners just you know haven't been that haven't cared that much because they haven't really had to or the historical incomes haven't been enough to support the maintenance and capital expenditures that it really takes to keep up a property uh, with, you know, I don't know if I guess 50 year old plumbing and all those other things. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's pretty high level to, you know, the deals, 225 units in the panhandle C class, um, early mid seventies build, you know, but little ways before the pandemic. Yeah. So what was the origin of that deal? How did now, were you the lead sponsor on that deal? Or did you find the deal? Just tell us a little about that. I was not the lead sponsor uh, on that deal. I was just a member of the the team that you know worked on, helped with the asset management, and you know bringing in investor capital, all that kind of a thing. The deal itself, as many large multifamily deals do, came through a you know broker in the area. I think that's one of the things that um, I see that misconception or or that perception has changed over the years. Where uh, back kind of when I was getting started, there were kind of a lot of people out there saying that, hey, you can go find an off-market multifamily deal. Come to find out here, you know, how long has it been since I, six, seven years later, that that doesn't really happen that much. Off-market, meaning without a broker involved, you're kind of direct to seller. Mm -hmm. It's not to say it doesn't happen. It's just not all that common. Now, when people say off-market, it's definitely going through a broker and that broker has almost certainly shopped it around, mm -hmm. kind of the off market means it hasn't really landed on their website. Basically, hasn't hit LoopNet is is really what off market means, at least to me uh, today. But yeah, came through a a broker as most multifamily deal, deals did at the time, and certainly still do today. So you talked about a team. Like we're, I mean, this team didn't come about on any out of anywhere. Like, what was the origin behind uh, behind that? Because you had a lead sponsor in that. It got to you so, to somehow. Um, tell me about how that, how this team came about. Yeah. So I, per, I'll speak from my own perspective on the, on the matter. I personally invested a lot of time, money, and energy in networking and real estate uh, in this, in this particular space before I'd ever done one of these deals, because I had, you know, the goal in mind to get that first one done or, you know, I shouldn't say 
that as a particular goal. My goal was to get started and, you know, start building wealth. And how do I have to do that was really, you know, I'm going to figure that out was, Mm -hmm. was the goal. So, uh, yeah, I spent years networking in the space. I, prior to the podcast I host currently the passive wealth strategy show, I had a show before that, that I decided to move away from. It was the seven figure sales podcast where I interviewed, uh, you know, real estate investors and sales trainers, people like that, just to learn about sales and and marketing and, and networking skills away from that because I found a lot of the advice became somewhat repetitive and uninteresting, frankly, and I wanted to just talk about real estate. So I got rid of that show and started this one. But <laughs> through that show, through attending networking events, through um, used I used to pre-COVID hosted an in-person networking event uh, here in the city that I live in where, you know, I was bringing people in and uh, bringing speakers in, bringing, um, you know, uh, attendees into the, the room. And that just um, helped me build my network more generally, not not just locally, but I could also post online about, hey, here's this thing that we did, the speaker that I had. And, you know, that just generally helped build a, a presence and a reputation. And, um, you know, the team kind of came together. The the lead sponsor started putting people together and, you know, seeing how could we get this deal done is essentially, you know, what happened. Um, yeah, pretty much what what went on yeah so is that was that lead sponsor directly a part of one of your like meetup like meetup groups or was a guest on a podcast like how did that how did how did you meet that person i think we met at one of those kind of national syndication networking events that are out there that everybody knows about there's so many of them and back in the day i went to a lot of them because uh, you know i saw this is my foot in the door now i go to very few of them because it's not the best use of my time. It's not where I find investors, that kind of a thing. But I went to a lot of those, uh, met the met folks and just kind of continue to follow up through hosting my podcast. I think he came on my my podcast at the time. And, uh, you know, that's one of the things that really surprised me uh, coming into the industry from without is just, you know, how much the, what the value is of just consistently taking actions like that and putting yourself out there. You might not know really what it's going to lead to in the beginning or even as you're doing it, but you have to really have that faith, but that by putting the work in, by putting yourself out there, that it will bear fruit. And then you can also, it's not just, you know, having faith in yourself and in the process, but look at the data and what's happening. If it's, you know, I want to build connections with potential partners, or I want to grow my investor pipeline or whatever it is, you can look at, you know, various metrics of, you know, who, who am I meeting or who's coming through my funnel or, you know, whatever it is, if you're a podcaster doing that, but, um, you know, through my, uh, business and podcast now, that's really what I, I focus on is, is, you kind of get somewhat instant feedback by hosting a podcast of, you know, how is this working? Is this bringing me leads or guests, you know, following back up with me saying, Hey, I you know like to do business together, which does happen, but it doesn't happen instantaneously, right? You have to continue to, whether it's follow up or um, one of the things that's really benefited me in, in just speaking with guests is guests on my podcast. It's just having conversations with them, you know, b- before we're recording or afterward, you know, just talk to the person. Hey, you know, what do you invest in? Where are you? Uh, you know, that's usually a good jumping off point or obviously read their bio, ask a question about it. You know, the good old Dale Carnegie types of things, get folks talking. And then you find that you have things in common or common goals. You know, some of the same people and you can get their opinion. Also a great way to get uh, the temperature of the industry uh, what's going on today, things that people are not talking about publicly that they will discuss privately. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's been great for me kind of going off on a tangent here, but yeah, through the podcast, through going to these networking events and just, you know, putting it out there. It's like getting a freight train moving, um, in terms of this, uh, on the commercial side of the industry, you know, um, a lot of people that I work with are, you know, experienced in the single through four family space and, there's guys that I work with that, you know, they would send a direct mail campaign of 2000 postcards out and they'd get three deals out of it, you know, that month. Um, and with commercial, it's like, it's like you're taking a lot of action and you're making a lot of deposits into the universe with no like instantaneous, like return on that. 
And Mm -hmm. you kind of have to be okay and keep taking that action and have aggressive patience through, (laughs) through that. Right. So I know you, you met, you mentioned, I think a guest in your show uh, mentioned, uh, oh, but Andrew, Andy Frisella, have you listened to him before? Oh yeah. 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 So it's like, um, and that's like something that was really frustrating to me because I used to be a deal junkie and I, that's exactly what I would do. Like direct mail was my thing. And then when I found like, you know, I wasn't closing, you know, closing loops on things immediately when I was trying to swim upstream and commercial, it was really frustrating. Uh, but, you know, I was, you know, getting some good guidance, you know, and watching people like, you know, Joe Fairless, for instance, I mean, you have a book in the background, there are the best, best ever, one of the, one of the best ever books, right? And, um, you know, he started the podcast with like, you know, I was like, I'm not getting any, any, you know, I'm not expecting have a guest on the show. I'm getting an investor on the deal. It's just making those positive invest uh, investments or uh, 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 deposits in the universe. At some point in time, the universe is going to conspire and deliver you what you secretly desire. Do you believe in that? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Right. I just, I, just, I think the the phrase "fortune favors the bold" is is really relevant here. And and Joe is, you know, my first mentor. I signed up with Joe, uh, mentoring with him, really early on, mm-hmm. early, years and years ago. And this was uh, at the time I was, you know, I wanted to get into real estate. I wasn't really sure how to do it. I wanted to do big things. I actually thought about getting an MBA. I took the GMAT and everything, <laughs> but you know, through rich dad poor dad and all that, I, this shoulder. Um, <laughs> learn that you know that's not the way to go but thought about it you know that's that's the 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 line but um yes i think the you can have a a data informed uh approach to this i think the other thing is that you know joe's a big tony robbins guy one of tony robbins sayings is that success leaves clues Mm -hmm. right so joe was a pretty early mover in terms of uh uh, again, another Tony Robbins thing, taking <laughs> massive action on having a podcast. Mm-hmm. But for those of us that are, you know, coming behind him, okay, it worked. What did he do right? You know, what really worked out for him? Mm-hmm. How can I don't want to say necessarily copy about that, but what clues can I take from that? And of course, bring my own personality and flavor to it um, and and kind of imitate his example in a way and apply that to my own business. So, yeah had a big impact on me over the years. Yeah. So let's bring this a step forward on this deal here. So um, you got this, uh, you know, lead sponsor brought in there. What was your role and responsibility in this, uh, in this deal, like to bring it over the finish line? Yeah, we did asset management. I mean, we all kind of split roles across and different people headed up different things, but asset management, you had weekly, weekly calls with the property manager, which turned out to be key and actually successfully delivering on the deal. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, obviously raising investor capital, everybody brings, you know, the expectations that everybody's going to help bring investor capital to the table, but it's, you know, people wearing several different hats and helping out and, and working together. But, you know, I think um, without that experience of helping in a few different areas, you know, I wouldn't have been able to grow uh, my own personal skill set and you know perspective on the industry and you know learn about how I wanted to shape my business in real estate in general so that I could focus on you know things that I like to do the most and I can do without them feeling like work, if you will. I mean, sometimes it does, but <laughs> you know, if you do what if you do things that are fun and find a way to monetize it, then what's the problem? So how much did you have, how much investor capital did you have to bring, uh, into this raise? Honestly, I don't even know. I don't, I don't think there was like a bottom or anything. It's been so long. I don't, I, you know, I don't think there was a floor. Here's what you need to bring or anything like that. What, what was your goal? I mean, did you have something there? I mean, was this the first time that you were raising capital uh, for, uh, for a deal? Cause I know you, purchased- for me, that was, yeah, that was my first investor capital raise. And that's a funny thing about the other thing, uh, uh, learn in that process is that everybody says get a deal and the money will follow Mm -hmm. total bs it's not true it's completely false Mm -hmm. you have to dig the investor well before you're thirsty as the saying goes um and and build those investor relationships and fortunately uh through you know working with joe but also you know hosting my meetup that was really big going to syndication events by having an email list and really, you know, putting things out there, putting knowledge out there and sharing 
that helped me build those investor relationships and and be prepared for when that deal came across. But I think one of the, I mean, the big lesson is that it doesn't necessarily matter how good your deal is if nobody if nobody knows, likes, and trusts you, mm -hmm. then you're really going to struggle. Now, I was able to bring investors into that deal, fortunately, of course. Um, but that's a big, I think a big shock for a lot of people when they first go to speak with their investor database or, you know, to speak with investors about a deal. How many people had said, yes, I'm very interested before that, you know, back out at the last minute for one reason or another. It's just, it's just reality. You don't get upset with anybody, but mm -hmm. you know, it's just not the right time, or maybe they didn't really mean it in the first place. There's many other reasons people back out. And that's that's where taking you know, again, taking massive action in growing your investor database and you know, growing your business, that kind of a thing really matters and you know pays off in the long run, but it it stings at first mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. So tell me about how that, uh, how that happened. So you had, you know, you're out there, you had a database. How did you approach, uh, this raise with that, uh, with that database? Did it start with an email blast to them? Did, was it, uh, you just, you know, picked up the phone, melt the phone, melted the phone line. Tell me about that. Sure. Email blasts is, um, yeah, we did email blasts and then, uh, we had a webinar and that kind of a thing. And, uh, I think that's really the way to go, honestly. And, and this is something I think about quite a lot these days um and i had heard at the time but the the goal i in my opinion should really be to become magnetic for investors we want to draw investors in i don't we don't want to chase investors down we don't want to become you know used car salesmen that kind of a thing mm -hmm. to me the blow up the phone approach um First, I don't know that today my compliance department would even approve that, number one. <laughs> but number two, I think people honestly hate it. Like right now, somehow, I, my, some syndicator got my phone number. I'm never going to passively invest in their deals. I have an awful lot of deal flow myself. I'm good. Mm -hmm. Don't worry about me. Uh -huh. <laughs> but they're using ringless voicemail to leave me voicemails about their stinking deal. I don't want to hear about it. They've... One time they called without ringless and I picked up and I asked to be taken off of their, their list. Guess what? They didn't take me off the list. I am on the do not call list. Like they're not giving me any opportunity to opt out. It's not worth the hassle to me to like call the FCC or whatever and tell them or FTC, whoever it is. I don't, it's just annoying. Right. And the, the thing we don't want to be when we're offering an opportunity to investors is annoying. Mm -hmm. We're offering, again, we're offering an opportunity. Our goal should be to get to the point where investors are asking us, hey, you know, do you have a deal coming up? What do you have in your pipeline? You know, they, we want to build a brand, build a business, build a deal, you know, type of deal flow, that kind of a thing where investors want to, uh, to come to us and approach us, not the other way around. And to me, it's just this, this situation that, I'm in is I think a perfect example of why picking up the phone and calling people just is, you know, it depends who you have a relationship with and everything. Maybe mm -hmm. some, one of your investors wants a phone call. That's totally different. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about that first call, you know, hitting up people that, you know, don't really know all that well, but you've talked with to, for the 506 B, you know, leave them alone, right? They don't want to hear from you. And they're, I just, I can't imagine the strategy is working for this particular sponsor that's blowing me up mm -hmm. uh, right now. But again, success leaves clues. How many of these big sponsors out there, these guys that have done, you know, between two and $5 billion worth of deals, how many of them are calling, you know, your average, you know, whatever million, $2 million net worth investor to hit them up for an investment that they haven't, they don't really know. They're just kind of telemarketing a deal. Mm -hmm. They're not doing that. Come on. They're going for after big fish. They want to draw you in. Of course, that's the best way to go about it. And, um, you know, there's just a whole compliance nightmare of it. Like telemarketing a security. Mm -hmm. No, thanks. You know, a lot of reasons <laughs> not to do that. Yeah. So, um, so you had an email, email blast and then you had a webinar. So was the offering materials, was that something that was like prepared uh, by the lead, the lead sponsor. How did you put those offer materials together? Uh, oh, let's see. It's been several years. I think he did a good bit of it. I, you know, I put my own stuff into it too. Oh man, I don't even know for the documentation, everything, obviously that all came from a securities attorney. Mm -hmm. Um, 
years ago. Um, as far as marketing materials, it was a, it was a mix, you know, um, put my own stuff in and it wasn't just email, one email blast. It's email follow up, you know, follow up if somebody expresses interest, you, you follow up with them. That's, that's a big part of it. You don't want to be a pest, but sometimes, you know, people have their lives going on and everything and you leave people alone eventually, but there is a, that's a big part of, you know, success in sales and marketing anyway, is just following up with people. Um, so yeah, it was a, a mix, I'm sure. Yeah. And then, uh, so did you lead this webinar that you had with these, uh, these investors or were just like, kind of like, Hey, my team's having a webinar there. And then you kind of took a back, like a, uh, a back seat on that. That was a team effort. It was split the, split the responsibility. Okay. Okay. And then how many, how much capital do you end up raising, uh, in this, in this deal, like for your part? If you just, you know, estimate a couple hundred number. thousand, a couple hundred thousand. It was, it was definitely below 500. I don't remember by exact number, not a huge amount, not, not a ton, you know? Um, but you know, I was, I, I would hate to say I was pleased with it. Cause I remember I wasn't, I would, I like, I wanted more Yeah, of course. Um, but in hindsight, you know, getting something on the board, uh, was, was really the, the goal I should have been going for. Yeah, I mean, I had uh, Reed Goosens on the show recently, and it, he uh, another another Joe Fairless uh, disciple, and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, he was like he had this list um, in an Excel spreadsheet, and he was like he's like I got you know to raise five hundred thousand dollars, I'll be able to do this in like in two seconds, and he was you know uh, very very uh, dis you know disappointed that like you know that of these some odd you know hundred or so people. Um, he wasn't able to raise nearly as much as he thought he was going uh, going to. So it definitely is a um, it's definitely uh, a hard you know uh, harder than you might think. Um, so going forward, like what did you learn as part of that de uh, that deal? What did that deal do for that experience do for your life and how it pertains to what you're doing today? Yeah, so many big lessons out of it. So I mentioned a bit earlier about learning and and seeing firsthand the importance of communication with a property manager, managing a property manager, you know, general asset management, especially when you have a, a property that has, ends up having a little bit more hair on it than you really expected. And this is, you know, there's so many lessons out of this deal that informed how I, I do, uh, do my business today. But, you know, I think a lot of, a lot of folks when they're first getting started in the business, especially if they go do, do a deal on their own, kind of think, that the property manager is just going to handle the deal. And it's just not true. You need to really keep them on track and, you know, make sure they're getting things done that you need them to get done, filling, you know, filling vacancies, managing expenses, all that kind of a thing, um, because they're going to get focused on, you know, their thing, which is the the day to day and, you know, all that. And we need to have, you know, especially if you're the asset manager, which I no longer do, but if you're in asset management, you need to have that you know, 50,000 foot view of here's where we are, here's where we want to head, here are the, you know, speed bumps or the clouds in the way or whatever we need to, uh, to get through. So seeing that, you know, experiencing that being part of that firsthand was, was really important to me and, um, and beneficial to how I evaluate deals and teams today, since my business today is solely help me raising capital. That's what I do today. And, you know, it's another, another, another topic entirely not involved with the day to day or anything like that. Um, but big experience there. Um, other ones were just the, how difficult it is to have a C-class multifamily property and, and really raise rents and the, the skeletons of the closet that you're going to find. And it's not just that deal where I, I learned that, you know, firsthand, there's also second and third hand experiences, you know, I've spoken with so many investors over the years, both, uh, you know, publicly on my podcast, but also privately, that's really more important where you can learn about folks experiences with buying a, you know, sixties build multifamily property. And I used to live in a sixties built, uh, home. So I saw that a bit firsthand, but when you have a sixties built multifamily property, that's been a C-class property for decades and hasn't been taken care of as well as it needs to, well, you're going to find a lot of issues that are expensive to fix. Mm -hmm. And when you fix them, don't raise your NOI. It's just money out the door. Mm -hmm. So it's not adding any value to your property. You're just, you know, having a big expense. There's a sewer is a great example of that. You could say, yeah, you're maybe getting rid of, rid of leaks, but mm, 
the expense generally doesn't make up for the the cost of a leak, at least in my um, opinion. There can be, you know, foundation issues, um, all kinds of stuff, and in, in older properties that you didn't necessarily see coming, no matter how badly or how much how much you got into looking at it, um, stuff can just crop up with with older deals, and that's why I really don't like older properties uh, today. The other thing is, you know, it's a C class property, and we held it. Uh, into the beginning of COVID. We no longer have this property. It was sold a couple of years ago, but um, into the beginning of COVID and everything with the eviction moratorium, man, that was that was a nail biter. Um, that made it difficult. Now we made it through, you know, we sold the property for a profit and, and did pretty well, but man, it was scary, especially early on when you have a C-class property, you, you know, this eviction moratoriums happening. You don't really know um, what's going to go on. So I think that's another reason to aim for, you know, a B class where you have a, a more professional, if you will, white collar employment base, mm -hmm. or maybe more of a, a mix where you have a C class, our, our employment base was all uh, mostly blue collar and the mill kind of shut down and all that thing for a little while. Mm -hmm. So um, <laughs> yeah, just a lot of issues. So that's informed my, why I prefer, you know, B class deals today as well. Yeah. So bringing that deal full circle, you raise the money, you help with the asset management process. You learned a lot in the process in terms of how to manage property property managers, which that's where I came from. I came from director of operations for a nationwide real estate development company. And it was an eye-opening experience in terms of how far properties can go um, when there is an active oversight of management of management teams. Um, and how quickly things can degrade o over uh, over a short period of time. So, um, and then also, you know, bringing this to the exit. I mean, what did that, you know, what did that deal, what did a deal do for your team, you know, finan uh, financially in terms of uh, on the exit when you sold it? Sure. Yeah, um, we made a solid profit. We exceeded the IRR expectations. Honestly, I don't remember the number offhand. I think it was a little bit over 20%, which is great. It's not what we expected. Mm -hmm. Um, so the, you know, the investors were happy. We were certainly happy. Um, so yeah, that that went well. Um well, there are other things that it did. You know, I think we all learned a, a lot of really big lessons through the deal. And when you can learn a lesson, learn learn a lot of lessons and make money at the same time, then that's uh, that's what you go for. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, before we go into the live q and I wanted to have some parting words. It's, you know, you're a professional capital raiser now, specializing in real estate. What words of advice would you have for somebody who is raising capital for the first time for like, let's say a smaller deal, like a million dollar deal where they have to raise $300,000 for and how they should go about doing that if they've never done it before in their life? Sure. Assuming you have all the compliance and everything squared away, and you know, I'm not going to talk about that side of the deal, but solely working with investors is um, have you know aim to raise 600, aim to raise the full million. Mm -hmm. It's much better to be in a position where you have to turn investors away because hey, we're oversubscribed, and I'll let you know about the next one. That's exactly what you want to aim for. It's much better than telling them we couldn't hit the raise. Here's your money back, or having to hustle <laughs> at the last minute to uh, to get the money. So really, aim aim for the stars. I think the more the more you've networked, not just with potential passive investors, but with other active partners and you know potential capital partners, that kind of a thing can help you out of a jam if you get in a jam because that that can happen as well. Maybe you wind up a little bit short and. You can work something out with somebody, you know, you can figure out the structure of that, you know, yourself, but having a lot of potential passive investors, having a really solid network, that stuff all, all really takes time, but aim to aim to exceed, you know, and aim to exceed your raise, um, have these conversations with your investors ahead of time. You know, I've, uh, you see a lot of posts on bigger pockets about folks who are getting started to raise and they haven't even had conversations with their potential investors yet. You know, they're just planning on calling family and friends who might not be real estate investors. And it's great if you think you have a great deal, maybe you even have a great deal, but you know, your friends and family might not be real estate investors. They might not be interested. They might 
not be ready because you don't have a track record. Mm -hmm. It just might not be the right time for them. Maybe they're not liquid. All these other things that pile up. So the more you can communicate with your investors ahead of time, the better. Maybe you can't share specifics of your deal. That's okay. But maybe you can talk about, here's where we're looking for property. All these other things, you know, dig that well before you're thirsty big time. And you know, don't get, don't count on one investor to, you know, fill that 300,000, you know, investment for, for so many reasons, but you know, they could back out, you know, all the other things. So those are a few parting thoughts on that. Yeah, no, that's, that strikes a nerve. Uh, you know, there's, uh, you know, some people that I work with that are, you know, looking to do larger deals and they're like, Matt, I met with a guy last week that, you know, he's full, you know, he's full liquid, a couple million and I'm all set on the cap, you know, on, the, on my, you know, capital raise of whatever potential deal I'm going to take down. And I'm like, you still got to keep putting the work in because yeah. this guy could get hit by a boss. Um, he might not like the deal you present to him might not be an opportune time. So, you know, building that network is, you know, you know, building it constantly over time. I mean, you know, it's easy for us to go back to the well with the same five investors we've been working with over the past, you know, 10 years, but we are still continually expanding our net network and it's of critical importance as we grow as a company too. So, um, Taylor, thank you so much for being on. We're going to buzz into the live Q&A. If you're listening to this on the podcast recorded version and you want to get in a live Q&A to ask questions directly to our esteemed guests like Taylor Lote, like Reed Goosens, Gino Barbaro, uh, Brian Burke, Steve Libman, the list goes on. Um, make sure to join the Go Big Live Real Estate Investors Group on Facebook uh, to get in on this exclusive Q&A session with our guests. So. Um, that being said, signing out. Thank you very much for being on, Taylor. Thank you.